Arahato Sama Sambudasa. Very, very nice. Okay. That's all I'm going to do because we have to see if we can actually make this work on time. And you got to coach me a little bit. You know, you tell me what you would like to do in the beginning. I want to learn from you what you're comfortable with. Because I, I will tell you something about our practice. Uh, I was trained by Bonte, and he's a forest monk, and we don't have a lot of ceremonies, and we usually have a lot of work every day when we were building the place, and we had a lot of uh, listening every night to Dhamma talks. But we didn't get into very much in America. We didn't. We got into primarily a lot of training, a lot of research and learning. You know, how, what is in the text that has to do particular with the uh, meditation? And I, I like working with Bhante a whole lot. All of these years, you know, this is my 21st year now working with Bhante Vimala Ramsey. That's really cool. I see you, Fulton. Hi, you, Fulton. My goodness. <laughs> okay, and I see many faces here. It's really nice to see you. Okay, so I'm just going to start. I'm going to, I told you if you read the program, have you all read the program of how we're going to format this series? Have you done that? Yeah? You just shake your head if you did, okay? And, um, so the way this works is it, it's an hour and a half slot. And what we're doing is we're, it's an interactive thing because I'm going to do in the front part of this, uh, I'm going to talk to you. Normally, I would give you a summary of your questions, the most important part of your questions for everybody, a summary of 20 minutes in the beginning before we turn it over to Bhante and he will give a one hour talk. Now, he will not take questions on this. We're not going to do that with this series. We'll see what happens. We want you, though, to write in at least one question after you get through the, the session. Write a question and send it to me in the email, and I will work with Bonte to write down answers, and they'll be sent back to you. So you're going to keep us busy for a couple days at least because I understand it's kind of scary. There can be up to 100 people that come into this. I don't know who all is here. I don't even know if it tells me somewhere how many people are here, but they say we can take up to 100 people. There are 32 people. 32 people, that's very nice. We always like 32 people, don't we? <laughs> okay, but um, it can be up to 100 people in here. And so uh, we've been, we have another session that's going to happen for Australia. We have another session that's going to happen after that. Later, when I go back to Ulasnagar, there will be more types of sessions, and we'll try to do more with the suttas. Our background is that our um, our okay it's 701 okay our background is that um, we established once this is kind of interesting um, I have a um, wonderful index that hasn't been printed yet a lot of things I've done never seem to get to be printed <laughs> but um, there's we established one time Bonte and I were stuck in in Moscow. And we couldn't go into the country, but we were stuck there for 12 hours in between flights. It was a wonderful first class uh, place to stay with card tables, pretzels, and about water, and that was about it. <laughs> but in my little bag, I had the Majima Nikaya. And after a little while, I said to Bonte, why don't we just go through the whole book? Because he really knows the suttas. And when you go through the book, let's decide which suttas you actually draw from when you teach. And I'm always playing this game of trying to, trying very hard to um, encapsulize what it is he found and um, make it in a, in a, show you how you can learn enough of the Dhamma and enough of the practice simultaneously 
which the Buddha called his uh, progress chart in the Digha Nikaya, was based on his measurable outcome. You, you would call this, uh, you, Poulton, would call this, you know, his measurable outcome system for whether his monks were progressing uh, poorly or okay or excellent progress. You see, it was a progress. Modes of progress report, I think it's found in the Digha Nikaya in number 28 and about section 10, if you want to write this down. In the Digha Nikaya, if you go in there, you're going to find it in that sutta. If it's not the right sutta, you contact me because it's I have it on my list. But that tells us that the Buddha, that, that the four points that are on this progress report, I, we didn't even know it existed until we stumbled over this thing, um, you know, actually tells us that the Buddha did have a system for figuring out the progress you're making and grading you on your ability to practice the meditation, but also your level of understanding of the Dhamma. And we, we've, we pretty much have established by documenting over a thousand students in, around the world now in the charts that I keep in the, uh, during the, um, the uh, retreats, we can see that the person that progresses the best is the one who is really giving ear, giving ear to the, uh, the teaching when we're teaching the Dhamma, taking notes, not just sitting there with your eyes closed. Because when you sit there with your eyes closed, I know you think you're going to concentrate on what you're hearing, but you don't keep it. None of us do that anymore. It's not something that is normally done in school. And we don't really keep it. If we just close our eyes and try to listen, our thoughts start coming in. And that's how we are today. So <laughs> our day is living, I see that. Yeah, so, so in order, the way he was grading it was he wanted you to have a pleasant, comfortable, not painful meditation. And he wanted you to have a good, quick, clear understanding of the Dhamma. And now we can see on the charts that people who can explain back the Dhamma we teach you and learn these eight or ten pieces that are connected, that help you to go to the deeper states more easily in your practice for observation, we can see those are the people who are progressing on, on in these retreats very well and having these experiences. Now, the way I talk about the experiences that people can have with this practice, I'm not so easy about saying it's definitely what the Buddha was doing. I'm not going to go there with that. I'm going to say it to you like this. This is the way I sort of talk about this. Um, we see, we believe from our perspective, from the descriptions in the text, that we found something that progresses and is identical to what's described as the path, the experience, and the outcomes in the text. That's what we feel this is. What this training actually is, uh, really, it's a completion of right effort by its original definition in the text. And Bonte will probably talk about that in his talks. So I'm not gonna go more into that. But the key to it is that you know enough of the Dhamma from the text, what the Buddha was doing, what he found, understanding uh, what it meant and how it relieves suffering and how it all operates. So. I would say, you know, people talk to me about this, say, how can you say this is that or this isn't? Well, I think today it's fair to say that when you're using any practice of meditation, it all comes down to, does it operate or doesn't it operate? Are you able to get on the path and move easily the way it was described in the text? Or are you having a lot of problems with pieces of it as you go along? Now, what I came to the conclusion this year, and I'm starting to talk more about it, is uh, that I feel like the Buddha, and other professors have talked to me about this, and they agree with me about this too, you know, that uh, the Buddha was actually teaching, uh, he was teaching people that were not Buddhists. There were no Buddhists 
You know, a lot of us are talking about that now. You know, he wasn't teaching Buddhists. He didn't do this for Buddhists. We have to all understand this no matter what tradition or what we're doing or what we're practicing. What we found with the, the investigations we did was something, if you add these instructions and look at this terminology, all of a sudden it does something new. It all fits together. And so the pieces we have learned before, maybe other ways, other places, are not disconnected pieces of a puzzle, but they actually fit together now. And when that happens, all of a sudden our practice starts going clear. We start to actually be able to see the origination, the disappearance, the gratification, how we get involved with what comes up, and the danger of that and the escape, and that comes from the Chichaka Sutta, MN 148. That's the whole thing in the Chichaka Sutta. That's what it's about. If you understand those five pieces, you can reach Nibbana. If you don't understand those five pieces and can't watch them work in daily life and everywhere, you can't reach Nibbana. He's telling you that in Majjhima Nikaya number 148, Chachaka Sutta, Chachaka Sutta. You go and you look at that and you will begin to understand. You can do that if you are uh, relaxed in your, in your practice. So tonight for this little opening, it's after, so I have a very short little presentation for you. I'm going to give you a piece of candy. <laughs> and what it is, is I'm going to give you the Four Noble Truths, which you've all heard it before. So if you have a paper and you have a pen, you write down the Four Noble Truths, okay? You have a paper and a pen, you write down the Four Noble Truths. There is suffering. The second one is very simple. There is a cause of suffering. The third one is there is a cessation of suffering. And the fourth one is there is a way or a path to that cessation of suffering. So that when you begin to experience what that cessation is like, it becomes longer and longer that you can keep it going in your life. It doesn't come permanently, permanently, until you get like way, way down there. And the, the one for the arahat and the fruition is the one who reaches the uh, fading away and cessation, complete or fading away and cessation of, total cessation of the suffering, see? But in 107, if we go in 107 in the text, we find out that there was a gradual teaching, there was a gradual practice, there was a gradual development. That's exciting because then we hear about in that sutta, in that one, we hear about there was an escape. In another sutta in Anguttara Nikai, we hear that he found the antidote. I was excited when I saw that. So here we go with the Four Noble Truths. We're going to take the Four Noble Truths and we're going to use them now. And you can use it for relationships in COVID-19. You ready? So in your house, you're all in there together. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> and you're stuck together all the time. And if you're Vanti and me, they don't even want to come in the house when you're at the door with the mask and they're bringing you food. They don't even want to come in the house because you know why? They say, well, I can't come in. And I'll say, well, why? We're fine. No, no, I can't come in. And I'll say, why? Well, you're old. I didn't know that happened. Our, our dig is cracking up. <laughs> I didn't know that happened. I don't know where this last 20 years has gone, but I have to tell you, I didn't know that happened. So now just because I'm old, I have to stay inside longer than you guys. So we've been inside since March the 22nd, and we've only been outside one time in a taxi cab to go to a pharmacy and to a food store and come back. Isn't that thrilling? Now, there, you know, he's downstairs, I'm upstairs, we have our own cave, I have mine upstairs, he has his downstairs. It's fine, we're, we're lucky we're in this townhouse, we're lucky this happened this way. 
But I have to tell you, it's funny when I hear people saying, my gosh, my whole family is locked up with me. All these people are here. Nobody's going to work. It's not the same for mom or dad or anybody. So suppose you're in a family. And now is where you have to write it down because I only have about 10 more minutes, okay? Suppose that you're in a family and there's a conflict. Suppose that there is a disturbance in the family or there's a disturbance trying to learn to work with learning computer to Zoom to teach and you're really frustrated. Or suppose that your sister and you who don't necessarily get along, or the brother and sister, or the brother and the father, or the son and the father, the, the mother and the daughter, suppose you don't normally get along and all of a sudden, oh my gosh, there you are. You're all in the same cave and you have to stay there, okay? What are you going to do? Are you going to stress out? So tonight, what I want to show you, this part of it, is you can change the four noble truths. Let's change them. Let's say there's a problem in the house, but they're not going to call it a problem. Let's call it a challenge. So there's a challenge. So first, you take a piece of paper out, and there's four of you in the house. And on one side of the paper, each person at the table, if all of you were doing this, each person would write down, what is the challenge in this house? What is the challenge? And you would write what you think about what the challenge is. This includes letting the eight-year-olds and nine-year-olds do this or about that young because they can tell you what they think the problem is and they get to have a piece of paper too, okay? Then you, turn, op you open up your paper, you, you, you folded it in half. This is the first page. Then you open up your paper and the second page, now on the second page, what you write is, what is the cause of this challenge in my eyes? What do I think the cause? Well, it's my brother's fault. No, it's my wife's fault. No, it's her fault or his fault. And you describe what is the problem as you see it, you describe it, okay? After you've done that, you fold the paper again and now you have the third page. On this third page, what I want you to do, I want you to write what you believe the solution is for the challenge and problem that's in this. Each one of you, okay, you think the solution is. After that, then I want you to fold your paper up and give it to dad or who the head of the household is. And that mom and dad are supposed to now sit down and they will look at this. Okay, and they will come up with an idea that is the solution you all can try for the problem that's happening with this family or with this office or with this problem. So now, does everybody have page one? Just nod your heads. Do you have page one? You understand that that's where you get to write down what you think the problem is, the challenge. Page two was what you think the cause of it is. And you can describe it any way you want. The kids can describe it any way. The students can surprise, you know, any way you want to describe it and talk about it. Be honest. Then the third page is what do you, you're in charge of the house. You tell them when they do the third page, you're in charge of the house or the office or the school or whatever. You tell me the solution. There's one thing that aggregates me more than anything else on the internet is to hear people complain and complain and tell you what you did wrong and what you did wrong and what you did wrong, but nobody tells you what to do instead and nobody offers solutions, but we love to complain. But when you describe yours in a group, it can be working for 12 people. I've done it with a family of 12, a family of six, a family of four. This really works. It can, it's an opportunity. Because then what happens is mom and dad look at all your solutions. Now there's a story. And this story comes from Sun Tzu. And it's in the art of war. And in order to understand the whole thing and have the best king in the world, I'm sorry, it's not Sun Tzu, it's, um, what was that other book? Lao Tzu, uh, you know, the 
Dao Te Ching, I'm Dao Te Ching. And if you look in there, there's a section in there for kings and queens and governments and everything. The best king in the whole entire world is the one who takes and listens to all his subjects and decides what to do from the six or eight counselors he listens to. But when he explains the solution to the counselors, each one goes, see, he took my part. See, he took my part. See, he's going to use what I said. He's going to do what I said. And they all hear somehow in the solution that you prepare, they will all hear you include something that you said to them should be the solution. So then mom and dad, they, or the head of the group, they present and how you're going. So what we were look, what we were looking at here is what were these these uh, four noble truths, and it's a way for you to increase the productivity in your office. This is a way to retreat and talk about how your office is operating, your house is operating, your class is running, your school is operating, your your company is operating, or you have a staff of 80 people. The Four Noble Truths, the Four Noble Truths are a balancing tool. They are the outline of Buddhism. So uh, the first way was the summary, and the second way was uh, his um, his uh, investigation, personal investigation for. Him. Okay, so it, there's four pieces, and the last one is uh, the reconciliation. That's what I found so far. If you can think of another way that you could use the the four noble truths, you should write me and tell me. And when you write your questions and you send things in, all of the contributions of people that we've been helping over the years led to thousands of writings that are sitting in my computer that have never been combined yet, and I'm working on it, okay? Um, so these writings come from what people ask and how they talk about things and how, what you're finding out and what you face in your practice. And what we're trying to do is give you an opening to do a sensational, marvelous, unusual thing in Buddhism. We want you to ask questions. If you want to understand why you go to the Chulagama Vibhanga Sutta, number 135 in the Majjhima Nikaya, it's very simple. If you don't ask questions in this lifetime, uh, that you're living now when this dispensation is here. In your next lifetime, the Buddha said to them, you're going to come back stupid. But if you ask questions in this lifetime, you acquire knowledge and keep asking questions. And unfortunately in this time, not just in Asia, but even in America, we have problems because we watch how the monks run everything and we think, oh, we cannot, we cannot, um, we cannot uh, ask questions, we cannot, interrupt the Dhamma talk. We cannot, there's no time afterwards. We cannot bother the monk. We cannot do that. So that we've, we've put this forth. Mm -hmm. So now you have a solution message. So that was your candy. And we looked at the four pieces of the four noble truths. Now Bhante's going to come over and he is going to start with the first talk. Okay. And this one is basically talking about what, what is the Buddhism? What did the Buddha set up as the Buddhism? What is the Buddhism first? And talk about the beginning training of that and go on with you, okay? So I'm gonna leave you, say sadhu, 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 yes, okay? Okay. So, sadhu. Uh, it's good to see all of you. I'm, I'm going to talk a, a little bit tonight about what meditation is, because it seems to be very misunderstood what meditation is and how to use it. So many people think that sitting is just about being like a statue and watching your mind. Let's try this again. Too many people just play at meditation and they're not serious with 
the whole process of meditation. The Buddha taught us that meditation has three parts to it. It has generosity. And generosity is not just giving physical things. Generosity is giving your happy feeling away to other people. You practice making other people smile. That's generosity. And it needs to be practiced all the time. Too many times we get caught up in life and disliking this and being in, uh, being stuck in your house with your family and you get grumpy. What, what is the cause of that? Why, why does that happen? Well, you don't think that this is because of meditation. You think it's just because I don't like what this other person is saying or doing. One of the things that was very important for me when I first started doing meditation was learning how to take responsibility for myself. Don't point your finger at other people, not for your problems. The more you smile, the more you give that smile away. you are actually practicing the whole Eightfold Path at that time. So many people get caught up in their daily gossip and talk about other people and who they are and what they're doing and whether you like them or not. So many people are getting caught up in breaking their precepts without really knowing that that's what they're doing. That is a big problem if you want to be a true meditator. A true meditator is someone that keeps the practice of generosity going all the time. Someone who takes the five precepts, you've only got five precepts. I have 227. So you only have five precepts to keep. And one of the hardest ones to keep without breaking is speech wrong speech. It is making or talking about other people, saying things that aren't necessarily true. The thing that is real amazing to me that I'm starting to see a lot more in Asia is foul language. Cursing. When I went back to America after I spent 12 years here in Asia, I was completely shocked at how bad the language was, how coarse it was. Anybody that uses coarse language is developing their hatred more and more. They're coming into their, into their situation with dissatisfaction in the mind. 
and that causes all kinds of problems in relationships. Too much time has been spent on just sitting and watching what you're doing with meditation. This is living. This is something that you need to practice all the time. Smiling more, laughing more, helping other people around you. That is what meditation is for. Now, some people, they do meditation because they want to heal this or that. Some people do meditation because they think they'll have better sleep. Some people want to do meditation so they'll be more calm all the time. But when you just use one part of this three-part series of generosity, morality, and mental development. You can't just use one part and forget the other three, uh, the other two. This is always interconnected. As you take more and more responsibility for your own thoughts and your own actions, as, as you help other people to overcome their suffering, that is true meditation. It's not a maybe. Now, when I give a retreat, I only give 10 day retreats. I don't need to give two week retreats. I don't need to give one month retreats. I don't need to give three month retreats of which I have done many of those. I only give 10 day retreats because if you are serious about doing this practice and you start by smiling all day, all the time. And I have people that complain and they say, well, if people see me smile, they'll think I'm crazy. And my answer to that is, you're crazy if you don't smile. You want to walk around with a sour face? On my website, there is an article about facial expressions and how it changes your mind. When I'm giving a retreat, I insist that you smile all the time. Smile. I don't care what you're doing. I don't care if you're going to the toilet. I don't care if you're eating. Smile. And the more you smile, the lighter your mind becomes, the more clear your mind becomes, the more balance your mind has. <clears throat> so you're not going to get caught up as much in emotional upsets, in emotional roller coasters of going up and down and up and down. Your mind is going to have more balance in it. Your mind is have, has more acceptance of things. And you stop having these emotional outbursts. The angers, the dissatisfactions, the disappointments. Uh, my, my situation here in India, I didn't plan on being here this long. I planned on being back in America in March. 
but am I angry about this? Am I upset by have, having to be here? No, it's just, this is where I am. Okay, fine. We have enough food. We have plenty of everything else that we need. So why get upset by it? Well, would, it, would I rather be in America? Yes. There's a lot of things there that I really wanted to do. Maybe I'll get to do it this year. Maybe I'll have to wait till next year. I don't know. But being attached to it and being frustrated because I have to be here and go through all kinds of peculiar things, putting a mask on. When I walk outside, I don't feel comfortable with that, but okay. It's got to happen right now. I tell people quite often when I'm giving a retreat, there is an acronym that really works well. An acronym is letters that have words uh, the, the short, short version of, of words. And that is drops. Don't resist or push. Soften your mind, smile. Drops. Anytime you have resistance to what's happening in the present moment, who's fighting the present moment? Who's causing themselves suffering because they don't like what this is right now? Who's getting caught and identifying and causing so much suffering to themselves? The more you smile, the better your mindfulness becomes. The better your mindfulness becomes, the more clear your thinking becomes. And the happier you become. Smiling causes joy to arise. The more joy you have, the clearer it is to see when your mind starts to get heavy. When your mind gets heavy, who gets caught up in that? Who doesn't like that? Who wants it to be different than it actually is? Now, what's the cause of suffering? Always in the first part of a retreat that I give, I talk about certain words and I give you different kinds of definitions for those words. I talk about what is craving. This is something that everybody is supposed to know what it is. They're supposed to be able to recognize it, and they're supposed to be able to stop it from happening. <laughs> well, it doesn't work like that. What is craving? Now, you have five aggregates, right? You have a body, you have feeling. Feeling is pleasant, painful, neither painful nor pleasant. You have perception. Perception and feeling are always together. When you have a feeling arise, perception says that's a feeling. It's either a pleasant feeling or a painful feeling. Perception is a part of the mind that puts the name of that feeling in your mind. You have thoughts, you have consciousness. Now, 
if a pleasant feeling arises, the perception says, oh, that's a pleasant feeling. I like that. If a painful feeling arises, oh, I don't like that. Craving is the very beginning of the false belief in a personal self. Anytime you take thoughts, feelings, sensations, and it arises in your mind, it also arises in your brain, in your body. Craving is the I like it, I don't like it mind. Now, I went around Asia for 12 years with a lot of very famous meditation teachers, and I asked them very often, what is craving? Oh, it's desire. And if you get rid of desire, then you don't have any more craving, then you don't suffer anymore. Well, that doesn't work that way. <coughs> okay. So it's real important that you understand what craving is and how to recognize it when it arises. Craving arises as tension and tightness in your mind, in your head. Now you have, your brain is like this and there's a membrane that goes around your brain. Every time you have a thought, every time there's any kind of disturbance, every time there is a feeling, Every time there is a sensation that arises in mind or body, it causes the brain to expand against this, this membrane called a meninges. It gets bigger, it gets tighter. That's how you recognize craving. Now it's real interesting because if you see this tightness happening, I like this, I don't like that, whatever it happens to be the cause, when you relax and let it go, all of a sudden your mind is clear. There's no disturbance in your mind at all. Your mind is very alert. So when you let go of this tension and tightness that, that arises in your hand and in your head, and you just relax it and let it be there, your mind is clear, very alert and your mind is pure. This is the third noble truth. This is the cessation of suffering. Now you smile and bring that smiling, clear mind back to your object of meditation and stay with your object of meditation for a long time. Now, when I'm teaching meditation, I always start by teaching loving kindness meditation. Why? Because that's the easiest and fastest way for you to understand how this process actually does work. And that's one of the things that the Buddha said. He said, when you practice loving kindness meditation or the Brahma Viharas, 
your progress in the meditation is much faster than with any other kind of meditation that's being taught today. Now, the thing is that it's real important for you to understand that when you come to me and you want to practice meditation, I'm going to say very clearly that I want you to only follow the instructions in the meditation that I give you. These are instructions that come from the suttas and they really work and they work fast. Now, another word that is very commonly misunderstood in the meditation of what the Buddha is teaching is the word jhana. Jhana is almost always translated as concentration. Concentration is a kind of meditation that if you don't have the relaxed step, this kind of meditation will make your mind focus very deeply and it will block your mind from having hindrances arise but you don't really learn much. And the thing that is real important is you can't carry that kind of concentration with you in your daily activities. I had a, a friend, a monk friend, that he was really into his concentration. He thought, this is the way you do it. And he would overfocus. And he would not hear anything. He would not feel anything. He just he would he would be outside standing and he would just stand. He wouldn't move at all. He didn't know anything that was happening around him. He decided that he wanted to get on a bus and go from one place to another. So I helped him with that. And I arranged the money for him so that he could get the ticket. He went, stood right by the bus that he was supposed to be on. And he got into his concentration very deeply and he missed the bus and he came back that evening and I said why I thought you were going someplace he said I I just I missed the bus well why did you miss the bus because my concentration was so good I just lost everything now a lot of people think that that's good meditation and it's not You're not teaching yourself the important things like practicing your generosity, keeping your precepts without breaking them, being able to recognize when craving is there. An important thing to also understand is that if you get into deep concentration, the meditation is only as good as your concentration lasts. And when it goes away, the concentration goes away, you still have the same kind of personality problems that you had before you started. Why is that? Now you're practicing concentration. 
your mind is on your object of meditation, it gets distracted. Okay, what are the instructions in meditation when that happens? You're supposed to let go of that distraction and immediately come back to your object of meditation. This is what happens with a lot of people when they practice breathing meditation. They overfocus on the breath. And they get into what is called a neighborhood concentration. And that the force of the concentration suppresses the hindrances and you can get into very deep, nice, happy, uh, blissful meditation, but you're focusing just on the breath. Now, with what I'm showing you right now is you're with your object of meditation and your mind gets distracted, okay? You have a hindrance arise. What do you do with a hindrance? You allow that feeling and that distraction to be there by itself. You relax the tension and tightness caused by that. When you do that, your mind becomes very clear. That hindrance that was disturbing you doesn't disturb you anymore. You've let it go. Then you smile. Why? Because that helps joy arise in your mind. That lightens your mind. So you become much more aware of how this process works. After you relax and you smile, then you bring that smiling mind, that relaxed alert mind, back to your object of meditation. Now the difference between these two kinds of meditation, one of them, it teaches you about hindrances how they arise, not to fight with the hindrance just because it's there, but allow it to be there by itself. And don't keep your attention on it. That way you're letting it go, you're letting it be. Right after that, you relax that tightness caused by that hindrance. Now your mind is clear. You have let go of craving. When you practice one-pointed concentration, when you over-focus on your object of meditation, and the hindrance comes up, it distracts you, and you bring that craving mind back to your object of meditation, your concentration gets overstrung. And because it's overstrung, it suppresses hindrances, so there's no real personality development. Now, I did um, some kinds of meditation for as long as 20 years. They were concentration techniques. I thought I was pretty hot stuff. I thought I was real good because a lot of people around me told me, oh, oh you, you can do this for a long time. You can sit for hours and hours and, and not move. So can a chicken. Does that mean a chicken gets enlightened? There's something that was missing. 
And what was missing was being able to recognize what craving is, how to let it go, how to have a happy mind that you bring back to your object of meditation. Now, because you're teaching yourself, I'm not teaching you, you're teaching yourself. You are your own teacher. Because of the direct experience that you get when you practice this way. So it's a real interesting phenomena. After 10 days of learning to smile, learning to let go of hindrances when they come up, not fight with them, not try to over control, not push too hard. After 10 days, you will feel more balance in your mind than you've ever thought before. That's a promise. I'm very, very used to having students that if they follow the directions that I give them, I'm used to seeing them be successful. Now, there's a lot of talk about Nibbana. I love this stuff. Everybody wants to have Nibbana. What does it mean? Well, what does the word mean? Ni means no. Bana means fire. No more fire. You're going to cool yourself. You're going to have more and more balance in your mind. And that helps you to have a different kind of personality, a personality that doesn't get angry so easily. Now there's more than one kind of Nibbana. Years ago, I was playing around on the internet with different Buddhist groups. And I would get on a group and I would say, you know, there's more than one kind of Nibbana. Well, where did you hear that from? What sutta is that in? Well, how did you hear this? Well, I heard it because I'm a monk. <clears throat> and? One kind of Nibbana that cools your mind is using this method of letting go of craving and staying with your object of meditation. Every time you relax, every time, you are practicing the Eightfold Path at that time. Hmm, isn't that something? This is called mundane Nibbana. You're letting go of the fire of hindrances. You're cooling your mind. And then there's a super mundane Nibbana that goes beyond the worldly kind of experience. Now, a lot of people, they hear about Nibbana, they want to experience Nibbana. I have some people that come to me that have been practicing for 25 years, 35 years, 40 years, and they have never really experienced Nibbana because they can't recognize what craving is when it arises or how to let craving go. Now, the word jhana 
is so very misunderstood. They call it concentration. And that is not the, the, uh, the real definition. I'm going to give you a definition of jhana, and it's much different than anything you've ever heard before. Jhana means a level of understanding. It is uh, a different every jhana experience that you have, say you get into the first jhana, well, your understanding about how you got there and what you have to do is starting to grow. Then you keep practicing and you keep smiling and you keep practicing the meditation the way that I'm showing you. Then you'll get into the second jhana, the second level of understanding. Every level of understanding, your mind gets more and more clear, more and more alert, and more and more equanimity in your mind all the time. The beauty of this practice is you can be walking down the street and be in one of the jhanas. Can you have joy in your mind when you're walking? Of course. Can you have equanimity in your mind while you're walking? Of course. So you, the jhana is a level of understanding. And with that understanding comes more and more calmness, more and more alertness in your mind, and life becomes more fun. Now, every time I give a retreat, the first, the first day of the retreat, I always talk about Three things that I want you to have, have happen during the retreat. I want you to smile all the time. I don't care what you're doing. Smile. Doesn't have to be a huge smile, can be a little smile, but smile. I want you to laugh. When have you ever heard a meditation teacher tell you to laugh? Why? Why do I want you to laugh? Because your mind is crazy. Your mind comes up with all kinds of nonsense stuff. Your mind gets caught in hindrances when they come up. Oh, sadness, anger, disappointment, frustration, whatever it happens to be. Your mind says, this is me. Fear, another biggie. This is me. This is mine. I have a lot of people that, especially in Asia, that tell me that they have a lot of fear. How do you get rid of fear? What's the easiest way of getting rid of fear? What's the fastest way of getting rid of fear? Laugh at yourself. Laugh. Chuckle. My mind thinks it's that's mine. It's not mine. Did you say, oh, you know, I haven't had any fear for a while. I might as well have it come up now. Did you say that to yourself? No. Are you taking it personally? Yes. When you laugh, it changes from, I am afraid, to it's only this feeling. 
It's only this fear. And if it's not mine, why do I have to worry about it? The fastest way to let go of any hindrance is to laugh with yourself. I've been in situations where people misunderstood me very deeply and I would get angry. Now this was years ago when this happened. And I would walk away from these people and I would be walking and in my mind and I'm driving my my heels into the dirt because I know oh, these people they just don't understand. And then a different kind of perspective came to my mind. And I had this thought that they think that they are my boss that they can control the way that I do things. And I started to laugh because that was the most ridiculous thing I'd ever thought of before. And as soon as I laughed, I wasn't angry anymore. As soon as I laughed, I saw that I'm carrying around this bad feeling. Do I need to continue doing that? No, just let it go. So I want you to smile. I want you to laugh. And one part of meditation that most people don't think about. And that is, it's fun. This is fun. Life is supposed to be fun. When you were growing up, did somebody come up to you and smack you in the head and say, okay, you're old enough now, you gotta be angry. You have to be emotional. You have to be pushing people around and controlling people and making yourself miserable. Somebody do that to you? No, we did it to ourselves. We misunderstand everything that comes up and we take all of our thoughts and our feelings and our sensations and we take them personally and hold on to them and try to control this feeling with my thoughts. Now it's a real interesting thing <clears> that's <throat> starting to be more and more worldwide. And that is people get depressed real easy. You depressed now because you got to be inside all the time? You frustrated because you got to be in all the time? Well, what is depression? What is frustration? You tell yourself, you know, I haven't been frustrated for a while, so now's the time. And then you try to think your feeling away. And the more you try to control your feeling with your thoughts, the more pain you're causing yourself. So, the more you try to control what's happening in your mind in the present, the more pain you're causing yourself. You need to be able to recognize this old pattern, this old habit of when this kind of feeling arises, I always act that way. 
when this sadness comes, I always make myself more miserable. And I go off by myself and I try to push these thoughts away or push these feelings away with the thoughts. I have students that are very much attached to their thoughts. And what are they doing? They are fighting what's happening in the present. They're trying to control what's happening right now. And they get frustrated and they get more and more sad and more and more caught up and cause themselves more suffering. So if you laugh with it, have you ever had those kind of days where everything you tried to do just didn't work? You had to get on a, a get a ride on a, on a vehicle of some sort at a certain time, and you just missed it. You had to do this. You had to do that. It was real important that it happened today. And everything you did, it gets worse. And you get more and more frustrated. So that's happened to me. Not so much anymore because I laugh more. I don't get so caught up in it. But I, I grew up in, a, in the 60s, the 50s, where we had songs that were just outstanding for helping uplift your mood. And one of the songs that I always seem to go back to is a song that says, Mama said there'd be days like this. And uh, yep, yeah, that's the way it is. And every time I start singing that, I start laughing. And then all of a sudden, all of that nonsense, not being able to get things done the way I wanted to, you become efficient. And you get this done quick. And you get everything done very quickly. This is one of the advantages of having an uplifted mind. And you become more and more efficient with what you're doing while you're doing it. And you start to have more fun in your life when you do that. And because you have more fun, everybody around you starts to go, ah, you're different. What are you doing? You used to always get so upset when somebody would say this or that. And now you're just smiling, having a good time, no problem. Well, that's what meditation is. That's what it's for. So that you can actually live a more full, efficient, fun life. Don't resist or push. Soften and smile. How simple is that? A lot of people, like the, the big, biggest complaint I get is it can't be that easy. I've, I've done so much meditation with so many other meditation teachers and they all say, you're supposed to be serious. I've walked into meditation rooms where I wanted to turn around and walk out because everybody was trying so hard that it was uncomfortable. So, 
I didn't think that that's what made the Buddha's teaching popular. A lot of people like to focus on suffering. Yeah, life is suffering. No, there is suffering in life. Everybody knows that. But what are you going to do with it? You're going to complain about it? You're going to cause yourself more suffering because you want to fight with it? Doesn't work. So it's a lot more important to be able to change your life around by your changing your perspective of life. Don't get so caught up in your emotions. I like this, I don't like that. That's just getting caught in craving. You have to be able to recognize those kind of hindrances when they come up. You have to be able to relax into things so that they're more easy. The harder you try, the more suffering you get into. So, what to do? Smile, have fun. I have some, some students that they did a 10 day retreat with me and then they wanted to do more meditation. So they went to another teacher because I wasn't around. And they would be sitting in meditation and they had a nice gentle smile on their face and they got told by the people running the retreat, you have to leave. You can't be smiling when you do meditation. This is serious. Well, if you want to make it serious, be seriously happy. Keep uplifting your mind. Keep smiling into things. It's real important to learn that we are in charge of everything that occurs. And we can have fun doing everything. Oh, I hate washing dishes. What's to hate? I got to clean this. I got to do that. I don't, I don't like doing that. Well, laugh with yourself and make fun. Don't get upset with it. Because that's unwholesome. You want to be developing a wholesome mind, an uplifted mind, a happy mind, a mind that has a lot of joy in it. So I've been talking for a long time. And I'm going to let Kima finish this. <laughs> <laughs>